Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all doing super, super well. So welcome to today's video. Today we're gonna be talking about Betty Gore and Candace Montgomery. This case is truly insane. I have no idea how I never heard about it until recently. It's a truly shocking case that happened over 40 years ago and I honestly feel like the victim did not get the justice that they deserved. I did see that Hulu did come out with a mini series about this case. It's called Candy and I believe HBO is also working on another mini series now with these shows i feel like they always like over dramatize things i mean obviously because they're doing it for entertainment purposes so i always like to do my own research offhand and dive deeper into it like i said it's truly shocking and it is graphic so just a quick warning out there so yeah that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about in today's video before we get into it i quickly want to thank today's sponsor fabulous Thank you to Fabulous for sponsoring today's video. Fabulous is a number one self-care app that helps you build better habits and achieve your goals. Starting when you first wake up with small steps each and every day that will lead to big and long-lasting changes. Now there's two approaches with Fabulous, habit tracking and dedicated programs. With habit tracking, you pick among 100 recommended habits or you create your own. They help you build these habits thanks to timely reminders and other features embedding behavioral science principles as well as science back content. Now I'm doing the dedicated programs approach, which is behavior change programs designed specifically to help you achieve your well-being goals. You first choose a journey and then you will receive regular letters filled with inspiring and motivating lessons that guide your process. Your new habits will be added to your daily routine and they'll send you little nudges to stay on task. I'm currently doing the staying on the road journey, which is meant to deepen my concentration and focus. I really struggle with getting things done, staying organized, procrastinating, Fascinating. So I love that Fabulous has been helping me create new habits such as making to-do lists, having a calendar, setting reminders, and just little things that will help me stay focused. Since I have a premium account, I can build and improve an unlimited number of habits in my routine and take part in all programs and exercises. So start building your ideal daily routine. The first 100 people that click the link below will get 25% off their Fabulous subscription. Thank you again to Fabulous for sponsoring today's video. So Betty Gore was born on January 9th, 1950. While she was attending college, she met a teaching assistant named Alan Gore through one of her classes. They immediately hit it off, began dating, and in 1970, Alan and Betty got married. Soon after their wedding, the couple had their first daughter named Alyssa. This is when they decided to move to the small town of Wiley in Collin County, Texas and start a new life there. Betty was working as an elementary school teacher and Alan was working as an engineer. Things were going well in the marriage, but soon the couple began to run into some problems. According to reports, Betty did have anxiety and occasional depression. She didn't like being home alone and Alan often had to travel for work. So that means that on the weekends, he would sometimes leave Betty alone with Alyssa and she did not like this. She just got very anxious when Alan was not around. So if he did go on these business trips, Betty would often call his office, the hotel he was staying at. You know, she would find a way to contact Alan and talk to him, tell him she wishes that he was home and kind of have him calm her down. Now this did stress out Alan. I'm I mean, he's at work and his wife is calling his boss. She's calling the office, you know, complaining. So this did bother Alan, but you know, at the same time, Betty just felt really alone. She had just moved to this new town. She didn't really have that many friends. You know, she wasn't really clicking with people around the neighborhood. So when Alan did leave her alone, she felt truly alone. Like it was just her and her daughter and that was it. So she was really struggling, but she decided to become more active in the community. So she decided to join the First United Methodist Church of Lucas, and she also joined the choir. 
This way she could be a member of the community, she could make friends, her daughter could also make friends, and you know, she enjoyed her faith, so she was really excited to be a part of the church. At this church, she actually met another mother and prominent member of the community named Candace Montgomery. They both sang in the choir and they started to grow closer because their daughters were actually very good friends. So Betty's daughter would often go over to Candy's house to have a sleepover, they would go to the movies together, go out to eat together, go to Bible classes class like the girls were glued to the hip which obviously meant that Betty and Candy were growing closer and you know she was just happy to finally have a friend. Alan was also very happy about this. He was grateful to Candy that his wife now had a friend in the community and through Candy she was meeting more people and just becoming more social which was definitely helping the relationship. Now just a quick background on Candy. Her full name is Candace Montgomery, but she goes by Candy, and she was born on November 15, 1946. She used to work as a secretary at Texas Instruments, and there she met her husband, Pat Montgomery. They got married in the early 1970s, and in 1977, they bought a beautiful home and moved to Wiley, Texas. Now, Candy lived a pretty comfortable life. Her husband, Pat, was making a very good salary working as an engineer, and this let Candy stay at home, take care of the house, and also take care of their two children, a boy and a girl. As I mentioned, their house was very beautiful. It was big. Big, it was wonderfully decorated, so they often called her house the party house. This meant that Candy would often host parties, she would host baby showers, host, you know, friends' birthday parties, you know, church events. Like she was just like the main person, and she was pretty much friends with all the moms. So since Candy's daughter was growing close to Betty's daughter, they started to hang out often, and Betty even grew comfortable enough to tell Candy about her marital problems. It turns out that things between Betty and Alan were still not good, they were still having issues, they were fighting constantly, and their sex life really just started to go down. It just wasn't what it used to be, and Betty didn't understand why. Betty was trying to do whatever she could to keep the romance going, you know, keep the relationship strong, and just make him as happy as possible. She told Candy about their issues, and Candy was like, you know what, why don't you like put something sexy on for Alan and try to seduce him to get the sparks going again. And that's what Betty did. One night, she put on a nightgown and she surprised Alan and tried to seduce him, but he rejected her, which obviously hurt Betty. She didn't understand why her husband literally did not want to touch her and it was just causing her so much stress. Betty didn't know what else she could do, but then she ended up getting pregnant a second time with another daughter. Now, she thought that this pregnancy was going to change the relationship with her and Alan and it somewhat did. Alan was very excited about the birth of their second daughter. He was feeling more connected to Betty, more connected to the family, and Betty was excited about this. Candy even threw her a baby shower at her own house. Things were improving between Betty and Alan. He even agreed to go to marriage counseling with Betty to work on the relationship. They ended up attending a weekend-long marriage counseling session through a program called Marriage Encounters, which is a program that their church led. This marriage encounter program seemed to be working, and Betty says that they did grow closer together, and they were both just so excited for the birth of their daughter. Then in 1979, Betty gave birth to her second daughter named Bethany. Now dealing with a small toddler and a newborn baby is a lot. I mean, it's overwhelming, especially when your husband is often out of town on business and you're left alone to, you know, take care of the two children by yourself which led to problems in the relationship between her and Alan. However, the couple was determined to make things work, so Alan told Betty, listen, how about we take a vacation to Europe and we go, we have a good time, and we reconnect. Betty was very excited about this. She felt like this vacation was exactly what they needed to reconnect and just make things work again. So fast forward to a couple of weeks later on Friday, June 13th, 1980. Alan was actually away on a business trip to Missouri and Betty was at home taking care of the newborn daughter and getting ready for the trip to Europe. Their eldest daughter, Alyssa, had actually spent the night at Candy's house and was going to go back home later to go to swim practice. So before Alyssa got home, Betty was just getting the house ready, you know, doing some chores, cleaning. As the morning goes on, Candy actually calls Betty 
and asks her if Alyssa can stay another night because the girls want to go to the movies and watch the new Star Wars movie. She even offered to take Alyssa to swim practice later and said she could stop by, pick up the bathing suit, and then take the girls to the swim lesson, to the movies, and then bring Alyssa back home tomorrow. Candy told her, this way you can stay home with the newborn baby and I can save you the trip to swim practice. So Betty said, yes, that's fine. You can keep Alyssa for another night. Then they hang up the phone and Betty continues on with her morning. Some time goes by and Candy stops at the house. She picks up the swimsuit and then leaves. Meanwhile, Alan is in Minnesota and he's been trying to get in contact with Betty for a while, but he can't seem to get through to her. He kind of thought to himself that maybe Betty was busy taking care of the new baby, so he didn't really worry and was just going to try again later. Well, a couple of hours go by and Alan decides to call the house once again to reach Betty, but she still is not responding. This is when he starts to get a little bit worried because as I mentioned, Betty gets very anxious when Alan is away from the house. She's normally always at the house and usually calls Alan a couple of times throughout the day just to check in. So now he's a little bit concerned because Betty hasn't called in a while and she's not picking up the phone. This is when he decides to call his next door neighbor named Richard Parker and ask him if he can go over and just check on Betty. Richard says yes, that's fine. He walks over to Betty's house, knocks on the front door, waits a couple of seconds, but no one opens the door. So he walks back home, he calls Alan, and he tells him, listen, I knocked on the door and no one answered. I'm sorry. She must be out. Which again, doesn't really make a lot of sense to Alan because his wife never leaves the house without letting him know. So then he decides to call Betty's friend, Candy, just to see if maybe she knows where Betty is. So Candy tells Alan, yes, I was at your house earlier. I did see Betty because I went to go pick up Alyssa's bathing suit, but I haven't seen her since then. Alan asks her, if anything was out of the ordinary and she says no. She says that Betty looked completely normal, there was nothing suspicious going on, and that everything seemed fine. She even told Alan that she could go back to Betty's house to check in on her, but Alan said no. He said he was just going to ask a neighbor to go back and then they hung up the phone. So then Alan calls back Richard and two other neighbors named Lester and Jerry and is like, listen, can you guys please go check in on Betty? I'm very concerned. So the three neighbors go to Betty's house, they knock on the front door, and then they realize that the door is unlocked. So they push the door open, they walk inside, and they immediately hear baby Bethany crying. They walk over to Bethany's bedroom and they see that she's inside her crib alone and is just crying. So one of the neighbors takes baby Bethany and brings him to his wife to take care of her while they continue to search for Betty. Richard and Jerry decide to walk down the hallway and check the bedrooms, and Lester decides to go check the kitchen, the living room, and the laundry room. He checks the kitchen and the living room, but doesn't find Betty. Then he decides to check the laundry room, and when he opens the door, that's when he finds the body of 30-year-old Betty Gore. Lester says that it was an absolutely horrific scene. There was blood everywhere, and Betty was almost unrecognizable. He immediately called over Jerry and Richard, and they all looked at Betty and thought that she had been shot. So they were very shocked, but they knew they had to get it together and call Alan and let him know about his wife. When Alan heard that his wife was dead, he was shocked. He couldn't understand how this happened. He couldn't believe it. He was confused. I mean, I really think he was in a state of shock. The first thing that he did was call Candy and let her know that her friend was dead. Candy was shocked over the phone. She couldn't believe it. She was telling Alan, you know, what can I do for you? You know, how can I help? And Alan was pretty much just like, I mean, there's nothing that you can do besides continue to watch my daughter while I catch a flight back home. I mean, Candy was just as shocked. She had literally seen her friend a couple of hours earlier that day and everything seemed fine. So she told her husband Pat about this and they both broke down crying. They didn't know what to do, especially because they were taking care of Betty's daughter Alyssa. So they did their best to remain calm to not alert Alyssa and they just went to bed. 
Investigators arrived to the scene and they said it looked like a horror movie. I mean, it was a very disturbing scene. Betty was covered in blood. Her wounds were so deep and so intense. And at first the neighbors thought that she had been shot. But upon further investigation, they discovered that Betty had actually been killed with an ax that her and Alan owned. They found ax wounds on her face, head, hands, arms, torso, and legs. She had a total of 41 wounds, 28 of which were to her head and her face. Based on the amount of overkill done, police believed that this was a crime of passion and this was personal. Now, as usual, police always look at the husband first. Even though Alan said that he was out of town, police still needed to confirm his alibi, so they spoke to his work, they spoke to the hotel, and they did confirm that he was out of town. So now that the husband was cleared, police still wanted to get some more information from him. You know, they wanted to see if he had any enemies, if Betty had any enemies, or if he knew of someone that would want to hurt Betty. Alan tells police that he can't think of anyone that would want to hurt his wife. So police were like, all right, well, do you know of anybody else that spoke to Betty that day? That's when Alan tells police, oh yeah, her friend Betty stopped by earlier to pick up my daughter's bathing suit, but that was it. So police go speak with Candy and she pretty much tells them the same information that she told Alan. So then Candy asks them like, do you think I had something to do with this? Like, why are you questioning me? And the police say that they really don't think she had anything to do with it because she was tiny. She's a woman. So they didn't believe that she had the physical strength to swing the ax up and down as many times as it was. They continued to look at the crime scene and they found a bloody footprint and they also found blood and hair in the bathroom which suggested that the killer had taken a shower in Betty's bathroom before fleeing the scene. They also found a bloody thumbprint in the freezer that was in the laundry room and a pair of woman sunglasses inside the garage. When they examined the footprint, it appeared to be very small and it also appeared to have come from a flip-flop. So police remove the tile that has a footprint and they take it in as evidence. As police continue on with the investigation, on June 17th, Alan calls the police and tells them that he needs to confess to something. Police are like, all right, what do you need to tell us? And this is when Alan tells them, I had an affair. Police ask him with who, and he says, with Candace Montgomery. So police are like, all right, tell us everything. How did the affair begin? Alan says that it started back in 1978, just two years before Betty's death. Alan and Candy had both joined the church's volleyball team, so they would often see each other during the week to practice and on the weekends for their games. One night, Alan and Candy were at practice, and they both reached for the ball at the same time and accidentally collided. Now, Alan didn't really think much of this in the moment, but Candy thought that this was very sexy, and that's when she says she started to see Alan as an attractive man. Now, she had already been telling her friends that she wanted to start an affair because she was bored in her marriage. She said that her and Pat's sex life was not good. She needed something to spice up their life. You know, she didn't want to divorce Pat, but she was just looking for some fireworks. For the next few weeks, she began flirting with Alan at practice, at church. She started talking to him more than she normally would. She would get more dressed up for volleyball practice to look good for him. One night after choir practice, Alan was sitting in his car in the parking lot when out of nowhere, Candy approached the car and told him, Alan, I want to talk to you you some time about something that has been bothering me. I've been thinking about you a lot and I don't know whether or not I want you to do anything about it. Before Alan could even respond, she said, I'm very attracted to you and I'm tired of thinking about it so I wanted to tell you. Then she just walked away. Now Alan didn't really say anything, he kind of just like let it go, but a week later they did have a volleyball game and after the game ended, Candy and Alan stayed behind to clean up the gym. After they cleaned up the gym, they started walking back to the parking lot and when they got to her car, this is when Candy blurted out, would you be interested in having an affair? Just like that. Like she just blurted that out to a married man the husband of her friend. So then for the next two weeks, Alan and Candy went out on lunch dates and they would have phone calls discussing the affair, setting the rules for the affair, talking about how they could have this affair and not get caught, talking about where they would meet. Like they were literally making a pros and con list about this affair. One of the rules they had is that if either one of them begins to fall in love, they will stop the affair immediately and that neither one of them wanted to leave their spouses. So they set all the rules 
and in December of 1978, the affair officially begins. They would often meet at a motel far from town and they would often meet during Alan's lunch breaks. Mind you, this is Candy's friend's husband that she's having an affair with. She literally threw Betty a baby shower and she's sleeping with her husband. Of course, Alan is just to blame. I mean, I think it's disgusting to be having an affair with anybody. The fact that you're doing this with your wife's friend and vice versa, it is just horrible. Now, when Betty gave birth to Bethany, this is when Alan decided to take a pause on the affair to focus on his newborn baby. However, just after a few months, Alan decided to resume the affair. It wasn't until Betty and Alan joined the Marriage Encounter counseling group that I mentioned earlier that Alan decided to completely cut off the affair because he actually wanted to focus on his marriage. He actually wanted to make things work with Betty and he just felt very guilty. So he told Candy, listen, this needs to end, and apparently from reports that I read, Candy was not too happy about this. She really enjoyed having sex with Alan, so she wasn't thrilled about this ending, but you know, she had to respect his wishes. Then from that moment, Candy and Alan never saw each other romantically. They were just, you know, friends at church, friends in the choir, but nothing more. Alan says he never told Betty about the affair, and neither did Candy to her husband. They both literally just ended this and then went back to normal as if nothing had happened. So police hear all of this and they're like, hmm, all right, the woman you had an affair with that is friends with your wife is the last person to have seen Betty the day she was murdered. And she was upset about the affair ending. So from that moment on, that's when they started to think that Candy might have been the killer. They brought Candy in for questioning again and they asked her if she wanted to take a polygraph test and she said no. This is when she decided to hire a lawyer that she had met at church named Don Crowder. Now Don wasn't a criminal lawyer, he was actually a civil lawyer so he didn't have much experience with murder cases. However, he enlisted the help from a defense attorney named Robert and they began working on Candy's case. They didn't believe that Candy was capable of this. They believed she was innocent and they were going to prove it. I mean, how could this tiny suburban housewife kill someone so brutally, especially her friend, with an ax? So while Candy and her lawyers are working on her defense, the investigators are checking the thumbprint found at the crime scene. They're checking the footprint. They're checking the glasses. I mean, they're basically checking all the evidence they found and it all pretty much led back to Candy Montgomery. So then on June 27, 1980, 30-year-old Candy was arrested and charged with the murder of Betty Gore. She actually turned herself in and was held under a $100,000 bond. Any oil or rich that can make, maybe you can have a You have the right to have your lawyer present to advise you before or during any questioning about peace officers or attorneys representing the state. If you are too poor to hire a lawyer, as she was changing into her prison clothes, staff members noticed that she had all these bruises and a cut on her toe, which investigators believe were caused from her swinging the axe up and down. The trial began four weeks later in August of 1980 and the jury consisted of nine women and three men. Candy pleaded not guilty and continued to tell the same story about her visiting Betty, getting the bathing suit, and then going back home. However, it wasn't until the eighth day of the trial that Candy and her defense team revealed something truly shocking. They straight up told the court that yes, Candy did kill Betty, but that it was self-defense. The entire courtroom was completely shocked. Everyone was freaking out. They couldn't believe that Candy had actually done this. I mean, she had maintained her innocence and told her friends and family that she was not the person responsible for this. People were talking about how after Betty's body was found, Candy was acting completely normal. She was still going to church. She was still going to Bible class. She was still hanging with the other moms, you know, hosting dinners and just didn't seem nervous. She didn't seem scared. I mean, she didn't seem as if she had just brutally killed another mother. So people were obviously shocked, especially when Candy revealed her side of the story. Candy says that she stopped by Betty's house on Friday, June 13th. She knocked on the door, Betty let her inside, and they got to small talk. 
They were pretty much just small talking when out of nowhere, Betty asked Candy, are you having an affair with Alan? Now, Candy was taken back. She wasn't expecting this. I mean, they both had agreed, but they wouldn't tell their spouses. So she had no idea how Betty knew this. So at first she tried to deny it and she said, no, I did not have an affair with your husband. But Betty told her that she was lying and she showed Candy these love letters that she had found between Candy and Alan. So Candy decided to admit to the affair. She told Betty, yes, I did sleep with Alan, but but it's over now. This is when Candy says that Betty left the room, walked into the laundry room, and walked back out holding an axe. She looked very angry and told Candy she never wanted her to see her husband again. Candy tried to reassure her and told her, I don't want Alan. Like, it's over. We're not getting back together. I don't want your husband. She says that Betty began to attack her. She pushed her into the laundry room and then began swinging the axe at her. At one point, Candy was able to take the axe from Betty. She hit Betty and then she ran towards the door to try to escape. However, she says that Betty caught up with her, pushed her, and began attacking her once again. Candy kept shouting at Betty, telling her to stop, telling her to not do this, saying that she didn't want her husband, that the affair was over, that she was sorry, but she says that Betty did not care and just kept attacking her. Because of all the shouting, this woke up Betty's infant daughter, Bethany, and she began to cry. Now, Bethany was not in the laundry room. She was in her own room, so so thankfully she didn't have to witness this. So when the baby started to cry, Candy was still shouting and telling Betty to stop. And this is when Betty turned to her and shushed her. Candy says at this moment she was triggered and that's when she grabbed the axe from Betty and began attacking her over and over and over. It wasn't just two to three times that she attacked Betty to escape. It was over 41 times, you guys. The autopsy showed that most of these hits were when Betty was already unconscious. Like she wasn't even fighting back anymore. She wasn't even moving anymore and she was still being attacked. Candy says that the only reason she stopped is because she was exhausted. She left the axe on the floor, walked over to Betty's bathroom, took a quick shower and then left. She went to go pick up her daughter and Betty's daughter from Bible class, took them to their swim lesson, went to the movies to watch Star Wars, and then just went on about her day. I mean, imagine you're with the daughter of the woman that you just brutally killed and you're at the movies like just pretending like everything is okay. Now, I'm not sure if she ever explained why she didn't call the police, why she didn't tell anyone about this, especially if it was self-defense. I mean, she could have called the police and been like, listen, I was being attacked, like I had to defend myself, like, you know, come here. But she didn't do that. She just literally ignored it and was hoping that no one would ever point the finger to her. Now she says that the sh was a trigger because her mother used to do that to her when she was four and her mother was very controlling. Her mother never let her express herself and would often shush her. So she says that that was a trigger and that's what caused her to go into this, you know, crazy aggressive reaction. Her defense team actually brought in a psychiatrist from Houston named Dr. Faison who evaluated Candy and had put her under hypnosis. He testified that Candy had experienced what is called dissociative reaction, in which she entered into a non-lucid state of rage as she struck Betty with the axe. So they're basically saying that Candy was triggered and just went into a moment of rage. She didn't really know what she was doing, and that's how she had so much adrenaline to keep swinging the axe. Now, the prosecution was not buying this theory. They were like, all right, yeah, two to three times could have been self-defense, but over 41 times, that's just overkill. That's no longer self-defense. Also, it was Candy's sunglasses that were found inside the garage. Now, Candy claims that she was never inside the garage, so how did her sunglasses end up in there? I mean, the door leading from the garage to the laundry room was closed during the attack, so there's no way they just like, you know, accidentally flung out and landed in the garage if the door was closed. The prosecution was doing whatever they could to make Candy seem like this terrible woman, especially by reiterating the fact that Candy literally left an infant child alone for over 12 hours. She knew that baby Bethany was alone. 
needed food, needed attention, and she just didn't care. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. And again, I'm just so happy that the baby was not there to witness this attack. So after both sides gave their closing arguments, the jury deliberated for less than four hours. On October 29th, 1980, the jury came back with their verdict and they found 30-year-old Candace Montgomery not guilty in the murder of Betty Gore. Then they acquitted her of all charges. Not guilty, you guys. That is just insane to me. I mean, the verdict was a shock to everyone. Everyone was literally like, how is this girl literally saying she killed someone and is walking away free? Of course, Betty's parents were completely heartbroken with this verdict. It's reported that Candy didn't really have any expression when the verdict came back. She just kind of looked very muted and then there's footage of her leaving the courtroom. She's walking alongside her husband Pat who literally stood by her throughout the entire trial. Even after finding out that she had an affair with Alan. So they're leaving the courthouse and Candy is quoted saying, I just want to get all this behind me and be normal again. Which I don't understand how she thought things would be normal again. I mean, she really thought that she would just go back to church, go back to Bible classes, go back to the grocery store and just like say hi to people around town and no one was going to remember what she did. Well, that's not how things went. People around town continued to call Candy a murderer a cheater i mean people were just really hating on this woman candy couldn't even go to the grocery store without being verbally attacked so she knew that her life in wiley texas was over that's when her and pat decided to move to georgia and have a fresh start now there's not much information about the family now there are some sources that suggest pat and candy eventually got a divorce but she still lives in georgia and became a certified family counselor so now she's in her 70s, she's a mental health therapist, and she's just living her life as if nothing happened. I don't think she's done any interviews talking about this. I feel like she probably will never do one because, you know, why would she want to bring this up again? So I don't think she'll ever do an interview, but I truly wonder if one day she will ever just tell the truth about what really happened that day. Now as for Alan, it's reported that he remarried a woman named Elaine and they moved away from Wiley, Texas with his two daughters. However, shortly after, the children left Alan's home and he lost custody of them. They eventually moved in with Betty's parents and it's not known whether or not Alan has a relationship with his daughters. He eventually did get a divorce from Elaine and is now living in Florida retired. I also couldn't find any interviews or any recent statements from Alan about this and it's reported that him and Candy don't have any contact with each other. Alan and Betty's neighbor Lester recently did an interview with CBS 11 and says that he still believes justice wasn't served. He says that Candy came over to Alan's house after the murder and was serving everyone dinner, introducing herself to the neighbors, and he said, you would never suspect a thing. I mean, this lady is here in the house where she committed the crime, is serving people dinner, laughing, and just acting like she didn't kill someone in this house just a day earlier. Lester says it's just crazy, and again, he does not believe that justice was served. 
So after Candy's attorneys won the case, Don Crowder went on to make a bid for Texas governor in 1986 and received over 100,000 votes. Then in 1991, he opened a sports bar in Plano, Texas, but unfortunately, the bar closed and his brother passed away in 1997. This really affected Don. His mental state began to decline and on November 10th, 1998, he took his own life at the age of 56. As for Betty's children, there really isn't that much information on them, which of course, they have their right to remain private and, you know, never make a statement about their mother if they don't want to. From what I was able to find, Alyssa and Bethany just really want to know what truly happened. They're upset with the outcome of the trial and they really don't feel like justice was served. They don't understand how Candy just got away with it and they say that the family has a lot of hatred towards Candy. They just want to know what happened, but nobody knows besides candy and I mean honestly who knows if we'll ever know the truth. I understand that you can claim self-defense but I just feel like over 41 hits is not self-defense anymore. I feel like you just can't do that to someone and walk away scotch-free. A lot of people believe that if candy was tried today in 2022 she would most likely be found guilty. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is a Hulu show starring Jessica Biel, and I think it was only like five episodes, and it was a really short miniseries. But again, the problem with these miniseries is I feel like they focus a lot on the killer and not on the victim. Like, I personally didn't like how they portrayed Betty in the show. Quick spoiler alert if you guys are gonna watch the show, but the way they portrayed Betty was like this cold hearted, dry, mean, like rude person. And based on reports, from Betty's family members and her friends and neighbors, they all say that Betty was a wonderful person, that she loved her children, she loved to teach, she loved her husband, she was friendly, she was nice, she was caring, and she wasn't like how they portrayed her in the show. So I'm not really sure why in the show they made her out to be, you know, some like evil lady. There was this really sad part in the show when the trial is ending and they tell the verdict that, you know, Candy is not guilty and Betty's like, ghost, I guess you can say, is standing in the courtroom and she's watching everyone get up and leave and just accept this verdict. And she's kind of like, that's it. That's all I get, like a not guilty verdict. And it honestly made me so emotional because I feel like she didn't get the justice she deserved. Imagine being brutally killed that way and your killer just walks free. I would definitely love to know what you guys think about this case down below. Again, if there's any other cases you guys want me to cover in the future, make sure to comment it down below so I can add it to my list. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button before you guys leave so you guys can join the familia and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.